Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Tom Woods Show, episode 2430. I am delighted to be joined by Chris Maidment. And you may think, I'm not sure I know this guy. But you know what? There's a decent chance you do because a lot of us saw his tweet thread not too long ago uh, relating to Americans for Prosperity and their endorsement for president. But he is a liberty activist in New Hampshire, one of my favorite states, and I'm delighted to welcome him to the show. Chris, welcome. Thanks for having me today, Tom. Good to be here. So you and I met at Porkfest a couple of years ago, but the the thing that prompted me to invite you on here was indeed uh, something relating to Americans for Prosperity. Now, what was that? That's an organization a lot of people listening to this will have heard of. And the thing is, for a long time, I wasn't exactly sure what the real nature of that organization was because I would get in, invited to state level events that would be super hardcore. They they didn't want me to hold back at all. But then other times I wasn't sure. But is it is it kind of like the Tea Party and where the the local parts of it? Some of them were pretty good but the national group wasn't so good. I, I never really got to the bottom of that. But then we just found out uh, they, they made a, an endorsement in the GOP primary of Nikki Haley. And that made me think, maybe I totally misunderstood the nature of this group to begin with. So I don't really know. Uh, so can you say something, first of all, before we get into that endorsement, based on your experience in the organization, what is its true nature? I mean, obviously there are good people in it. So... Just a short history here, Tom, just to go back. In, in the founding of AFP was in 2004. And before that, it was Citizens for a Sound Economy. Ron Paul was the first president of Citizens for a Sound Economy. I'm sure everybody listening to this will know who Ron Paul is. That was in 1984. But, you know, fast forward to 2004, there was a disagreement on, on a path forward. And uh, half the board said, you know, we should be state-based and, and do really awesome things at the state level. And the other half wanted to be federally focused. And so they split into AFP and FreeWorks. And so that was in 2004. AFP has been around um, almost 20 years now. And they started in Kansas and then they moved on to other states. The New Hampshire chapter opened in 2008. Uh, Corey Lewandowski was the first state director. Um, he went on to, to help get President Trump get elected in 2016, of course. The current state director there has been around in New Hampshire politics for, for quite a long time. He's been at AFP for 11 years now. And so my, my understanding, you know, the, the organization that I grew to love when I met them in 2017, they purely, almost, almost purely focused on state-level policy and then politics in order to affect that policy, right? Because if you don't have policy champions in the legislature, you can't pass the policies that you're, that you're working for. And, and that was 95% of what they did. And, they, they, you know, up till, up till this year, that was, that's what we did. Last year, we endorsed 47 different liberty, liberty loving candidates here in New Hampshire. We got most of them over the line. They're in the legislature now doing, doing as, as much as they can, passing education freedom accounts, lowering taxes, uh, you know, strengthening Second Amendment rights. They're doing all kinds of awesome things. And... Th that was like the bread and butter. That's what I understood the organization to be. There are 35 other brick and mortar state chapters around the country that were also doing really awesome things at their states. South Carolina passed certificate of need. You know, Iowa passed universal education freedom. Florida passed universal education freedom. And so lots of really great people at the state level doing really awesome things. Um, and so all the various state chapters are, are just out there, like you said, inviting you to do this This. Awesome, awesome stuff. They're not holding back, right? They're getting, getting crazy work done at the state level. And then this February, uh, headquarters, uh, our CEO, Emily Seidel, uh, I guess I shouldn't say R anymore, but uh, the CEO, Emily Seidel, announced that they were going to take, take a path forward to turn the page on the past, is the words that they used, to make sure that Donald Trump doesn't get the nomination again. And so that the country can move forward in, in all of that. And that, is, that was in February. And then, of course, last week, you saw Americans for Prosperity Action, AP Action, endorsed Nikki Haley for president. And I think a lot of people, uh, you, you, I saw your tweet, you were shocked by that. Yeah, and um, I, I'm, I was shocked maybe, by that. Chris, I think I might have, in my anger at the situation, I might have 
uh, been unfair to the good people in the organization. So I, I, I am sorry about that. Well, uh, you, you know, I think it's, it's, it's hard to separate sometimes, right? Because the organization did a thing. It doesn't mean all the people in the organization agreed with the thing. Yeah. Um, and so, so certainly uh, really shocking, right? Because in, in my view, my personal view, she was so counter to so many of the policies that we've advocated for for years, um, a restrained foreign policy. Uh, the opposite, you know, uh, a, fair, a fair market, a, free, a fair and free market, not cronyism and corporatism and, and subsidies. And, uh, you know, free speech is one of the, the key pillars of what Americans for Prosperity advocates for. And it was two weeks ago, she was rallying to ban anonymous speech online. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those things, it was like, it, to, to, to me, I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it. Um, in fact, other when she than announced, fact that, even when she announced that she was running, I remember thinking, this is completely tone deaf. There is no more any market for a Nikki Haley. What, what could she be thinking? And then I forgot, well, you know, the hangers on, the, 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 the people who expect checks with their names on them in their pockets, you know, in the, in the various sectors like the, the military industrial complex or whatever. Yeah, I can imagine that those people would, would support her, but the idea that an Americans for Prosperity would choose her, especially when there's a Ron DeSantis there. And you know, even if you want to hedge your bets a little bit on foreign policy, okay, well then Ron DeSantis is probably going to be somewhere between Ron Paul and uh, Nikki Haley. So you could always go with him. So why they wouldn't even pick him is astonishing. Well, in, in the memo that came out, uh, when they announced this, right? It, it laid out all the numbers. It laid out the polling. Nikki Haley's in second in Iowa. Nikki Haley's in second in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley's in second in South Carolina. Okay. Um, and, yeah. you know, if, l let's say that, let's, let's just agree that that might be the case, right? Let's, I'll take them, take them at face value on that. You know, for, for an organization the, that espouses principles above politics and people above politics, uh, it, it didn't make sense to me that just because she has a shot, she would be the one. Yeah. And, um, you know, the trade-off being that we're, we're picking somebody less principles that has a better shot. And I, I you know, personally, um, I would like to see somebody that's more principled that has a little bit less of a shot, you know? Um, and, and uh, you know, I think there was obviously, I, I don't know how the how the decision was made. I wasn't privy to those conversations. Nor, I'm not, I'm not in, I was down on the ground in New Hampshire just doing what we do here. So I wouldn't have expected to get a say in the matter. Um, but I certainly, you know, disagree with it wholeheartedly. Yeah, so that, that is quite, for some reason it reminds me a little bit of uh, the year, what, what was it? I guess 2008 was when McCain got the nomination. And I remember he was actually not leading in the polls. He just had a, a surge and the surge just built on itself because once he did well, started doing well, then other people thought, oh, okay, well, then McCain is plausible. But I remember on the news, the newscaster or the, the reporter was interviewing voters and one person said, yeah, I see, and I guess he was going into the voting booth. I, McCain seems to be doing very well, so I guess I need to vote for him. And I thought, what a bizarre thing to say. <laughs> that you don't have to vote for anybody on the basis of anything like that. And not to mention, if you have a big platform, like, you know, AFP has a reasonable platform, use it maybe to give the underdog a boost. You know, who, yes, he might not win, but um, that's what, what's your platform for if not to elevate somebody with it? No, I totally agree. And, and you know, it's funny because that's just human nature, right? You know, uh, well, oh, look, they've got the momentum. I, I'm going to go join join the party. I don't yeah. want to be late to the party. I don't want to miss the party. I want to be part of the inner crowd. Yeah. And that's largely what we saw with with Donald Trump in 2016, right? I think, you know, at first, everybody kind of thought it was a joke. And, and then he murdered Jeb Bush on the debate stage. And then he murdered other people on the debate stage. And people were, he was gaining momentum. And it, and it kind of builds on itself, right? It's self-reinforcing. It's a, a, a virtuous cycle, if you will, yeah. where... You're, you're saying these things, people are coming, and then because they're coming, other people are coming, and it just keeps building on itself. But I, I think in this case, you know, at least I hope, right, with Nikki Haley, that I, I hope there's a hard ceiling of the Bush-McCain era foreign policy hawk Republicans. Yeah. That's my hope. Um, we, we saw, you know, Donald Trump had a pretty realistic and restrained foreign policy. 
Uh, a lot of people thought he was going to start World War III. That didn't come to fruition, thank goodness. He didn't start any new wars. Um, he he set in motion ending the war in Afghanistan. And, and he did a lot of great things. Like, I mean, you disagree with the man all you want. Like, he's, he's not a great, uh, you know, he can't keep his mouth quiet for two seconds. And he does a lot of, you know, he says a lot of uh, nutty things that turn people off. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. But his policies as president, he did a lot of good things. And so in the foreign policy sphere, I, I agreed with a lot of what he did. So I, maybe we could, you know, I, I'm hoping that he set, in, in, set us on a path to continue the trajectory in that direction and away from, you know, Bush and McCain era foreign policy. That's my hope. And we'll, we'll see, you know, in the seven weeks, we'll find out what happens in New Hampshire. So, yeah, I, and it's, it's starting to seem as if the real home for Bush McCain foreign policy is increasingly the Democrats. So it's, you know, it's, it's interesting that the remaining Republicans who are on board for it, who claim to be such opponents of the Democrats, aren't quite perceiving that. But at the same time, even to see, I mean, yes, Nikki Haley is higher in the polls than I'd like. But if you and I were 20 years ago predicting where would a George W. Bush clone be in the polls 20 years hence, we wouldn't have thought completely in the basement uh, and, and with, with very, very little to no grassroots support whatsoever. I mean, there really has been a major a sea change here. And, and yeah, even, even the, uh, the Republicans who, let's say, do want a more restrained foreign policy, half the time they're still not as good as I'd like them to be. But they're better than they used to be, and I think they're heading in the right direction, and their rhetoric is very good. So, I mean, I, I still take it as a, as a win that, that Haley is, you know, such a, uh, you know, such a distant second or third or whatever. Um, but in terms of AFP, so, so you, you posted, let's get to your, your tweet thread. You had a tweet thread where you said more or less what you just told me. You've been with the organization. You believe in it deeply. And it is shocking to you that it would betray what its stated principles were um, by means of this endorsement. And, and you said something like, you know, I haven't cleaned out my office, but I have a, you know, I could get fired for this tweet thread. And then I saw, I don't know if, who was it? Was it Jack Posobiec or somebody retweeted you and said, update, he got fired. So to, to, first did, of all, talk to me about the thread. Yeah. And talk to me, like, did you get a phone call saying, hey, you are not allowed to say this, or how did it all unfold? Well, well, first, I mean, so last, the endorsement came out on Tuesday, um, and, and some great advice that I got from, from a lot of people was don't do anything immediately. You know, sleep on it, think about it. Um, obviously, your, for my first instinct was like, I'm just going to walk out. I'm going to clean out my desk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk out of here. Um, and I, I, I slept on it. I thought about it. I talked to my wife before I did anything. She, she appreciates that, believe me. Um, and I, you know, I thought about it on Tuesday and Wednesday and, and Thursday. And then on, on Friday, I think uh, it, I had just, I had stewed on it so much that it, it, I probably should have talked about it more, I guess. Like, you know, it helps to get things out. But at the end of the day, I, I said, yeah, I can't. I can't do this in, in good conscience. I can't help. Um, Nikki Haley, I can't, I can't help a candidate I so vehemently don't believe in. A candidate I don't want to win. That's, that's just disingenuous. It's not, it's not fair to, to myself. It's certainly not fair to the people I would be working with or, or to the, you know, I, I, it wouldn't be fair to the organization. And so, you know, when I tweeted that, um, just to be clear, I didn't think I'd be fired for saying what I said. Um, I, I thought I'd be fired because I was in the thread saying that I wasn't going to do the job, right? And my job in New Hampshire would have been to mobilize and activate a grassroots army to go door to door, to do phone calls, uh, to do the work. That, that was my job, was to, to do that work. And I very clearly stated I wasn't going to do it. Um, so yeah, I got a call Saturday and they said, you know, look, we understand how you feel. Um, and you just, you, you very, very publicly told the entire world that you weren't going to do the job. And well, you know, if you're not going to do the job, then, you know, we're going to have to separate here. Um, so I did go yesterday. I, uh, I went and cleaned up my office, said goodbye to all the, the great people that I worked with in New Hampshire. Um, I'm not going far. I, I hope to still see them around. I hope to still be friends with those guys, those guys and gals. They're, they're wonderful people. 
Um, I just, I wasn't going to do the work. And, you know, I think that's obvious the reason I was, I was terminated for sure. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, me. I just released my first book in nine years, Diary of a Psychosis, How Public Health Disgraced Itself During COVID Mania. This, my friends, is the definitive smash. This is the book, even one or two chapters of which can change the mind of your stubborn friend. By the way, I recommend when dealing with stubborn friends, you say, I'll read something you want me to read if you read something I want you to read. That's only fair. And I promise you, if you give the person my book or even just a few chapters of my book, my book will be way better and more convincing than anything they want you to read. So you're going to win. At the very least, you'll start chipping away at some of the NPCism of these people. You'll start chipping away at the resistance. You'll start getting people to think that maybe the establishment does not have our best interests at heart after all. Chapter after relentless chapter, day after day, this book in recounting what happened is a sledgehammer to the bad guys. You will stand up and cheer as I go over the things they told us as compared to the things that actually happened. You are going to love it. We need to focus on this and not just let it go and say, oh, well, that was a few years ago. Now let's just forget all about that. When has that ever worked for a free people? No, we have to have the definitive account to smash them, both for our sake and for rising generations. I want my own kids to know all the details of exactly what was done to us and how evil and pointless it all was. And in particular, I want you to know that I've got two bonus books for you for free if you buy this first one. No matter where you get this first one, you can go to diaryofcovid.com and get your bonuses. You can even get Diary of a Psychosis itself at diaryofcovid.com. And when you go to diaryofcovid.com, you'll also see one of the free bonuses is a book called Collateral Damage, in which I collected some of the stories of people who suffered severely during the lockdowns and other restrictions. There is, to my knowledge, no such book anywhere. Nobody has collected these stories, but we need to hear these stories. It is inhuman that these people were not allowed to tell their stories. Well, now they are in this free companion volume to my book, Diary of a Psychosis. So get the book and all the neat bonuses over at diaryofcovid.com. That is where you should go now, diaryofcovid.com. And help me spread the word because it's the definitive smash and man, is it delicious. So I think a lot of people find it hard. I mean, even though we admire what you did, find it hard to conceive of themselves in that situation, taking that kind of bold stance because there's so many people who will, I mean, they'll, they'll sell you their own grandmother in exchange for a paycheck and you just wouldn't. And you had to know that the chances were, shall we say, greater than 50-50 that this was the last tweet thread you would be typing uh, as a member of that organization. I mean, how do you account for this? As in terms of, uh, you know, like the people that would sell their grandmother, that's funny. Um, my, my, you know, how do I account for that? Well, I got into this, Tom, in, in 2017. Um, now, full disclosure, in 2016, I was, I was very, very pro-Trump. I didn't have well-formed policy positions. I didn't have a, a solid foundation. And I kind of, like a lot of voters in this country, kind of swayed with the breeze. Um, I listened to Fox News and CNN, and that's kind of where I got a lot of my opinions from, right? And in 2017, when I went to, it was called uh, Grassroots Leadership Academy. And came into that class, my wife and I and my six-week-old baby, um, and started learning. And first of all, we met a great group of like a great cohort in that class that I'm still close with a lot of them today. We do a lot of work together in the, in the Liberty space here in New Hampshire. But I learned so much from, from, the, from my classmates, from the people that worked there. They really helped me form a foundation of beliefs that that I could, you know, that I could go back to. So anytime a policy question comes up for me or, or a question on 
what the right thing is. I can go back to that foundation. I can go back to those principles and I can make a decision based on those. And so as, as the years went on, 2018, 2019, I was doing uh, activism through, through AFP. I was you know, working on other campaigns here in New Hampshire. And I started to really form uh, my core beliefs of, of what I believed and what is right and what is wrong. And so it, when I came out and took that bold stance, first of all, first of all, it was, you know, for me, I, I just so, I couldn't picture myself doing the work. Um, for the last three years, I've been doing work that I thoroughly believe in doing, uh, completely bought into the mission, completely motivated by the outcomes that we're trying to get to, com- you know, my, a freer New Hampshire specifically, you know, we've, we've done a lot of great things here. We have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great things that we can do moving forward. And that passion just burns, burns in me, right? Like we can, we can do this at the state level and doing this work. When I sat back and thought about it, doing this work that I so vehemently disagree with, um, I've worked jobs that I wasn't passionate about before. And I remember being miserable and I, I probably could have stuck my head in the sand done this for seven weeks until the New Hampshire primary, gotten through it and gotten back to to what we do and what we're passionate about. But right now, uh, just going back to that that passion that drives me, the the vision of of the New Hampshire that I want to see, Nikki Haley doesn't fit into that picture at all. And and having her in office doesn't doesn't help that mission. It it hurts that mission in a lot of ways. And so that's that's kind of what what drove it, right? I was just, I, I had to get back to, I had to, to be honest with myself and had to be honest with, with other people about how, how deeply uh, opposed to this I was. Um, and so, you know, certainly wouldn't sell my grandmother for, for a paycheck. Um, <laughs> that was the first thing that occurred to me. I don't know why. I'm, that's going to, that's going to, that's going to stick with me now. Cause I think you're right. There are a lot of people, you know, in politics and in a lot of industries that would, that would, right. Um, but then, then but what I'm happens not, I'm is not they, in this for the paycheck. They, they rationalize it in their minds. Like they, they don't actually, they don't want to live with themselves thinking I sold up my principles for money. They'll, they'll make some excuse. Well, you know, I have to be in the organization to help reform it or like what, whatever. And, and, and I understand that it's hard to live with yourself in that kind of situation. Um, but man, you don't have to live with yourself in that situation because you did what you did. Now, I asked you at the beginning, and I understand if you don't want to um, get into this too much, but I don't want people to be worried about you because I, you know, I, we barely know each other. We don't really know each other at all. But I saw this, and frankly, my first instinct was I was worried about you. And I thought, right at Christmas time, this guy now suddenly has no income. So I thought, come on the Tom Wood Show, and somebody is going to see your talents, and you're going to land on your feet and be fine. Well, okay, I, I, you know, I, I, I realize that the, the, the way that sounds, I, I don't mean it to be arrogant. I mean it as I have a platform. Maybe we can find something for you. But it turns out you don't need Tom Woods. <laughs> so tell me about what happened. Well, uh, you know, the, the tweet, the, the tweet, I didn't expect it to grow the legs that it did. But I mean, Friday night, it's just like it took off. Um, it, you know, a fair amount of palace intrigue, of course, people, you know, the, the AP endorsement had just come out and, and, you know, it caught the eyes of uh, influential people on the platform, and all of a sudden, it was everywhere. Um, and so, I joked with you earlier. I've been busier this week than I was last week, and that's you know, it, by and large, a joke. It's just been a different kind of busy. But my phone has been ringing off the hook, which is a good thing. Um, a lot of people here in New Hampshire, um, a few of the few campaigns I've I've been talking to, I've got. I've got options. So I appreciate it, you know, the concern right before Christmas, but thankfully I met uh, a wonderful woman uh, eight years ago, nine years ago almost, who kind of straightened me out. I used to be a, a, you know, spend all my money and it would burn a hole right through my pocket. And she, she you know, she put the clamps down on that. And, and she's, you know, we've got, a, we've got some savings. We're, we're comfortable. Um, nothing to worry about yet. So we, we've got, you know, time, I've got time to figure out what the next move is for me, what's right for me, what's right for my family, and, and how can I best help the mission of liberty. Let's take a minute to thank our great sponsor, Delete Me. I know many of you listening to this understand the importance of data privacy online, but recently it's become more urgent than ever. Yes, we want to avoid identity theft and we have other concerns too, but the potential 
for doxing and harassment, and worse, has suddenly become much more dire. For instance, we've seen jurors connected to Trump cases having personal information about their families spread. The conflict between Israel and Hamas has likewise resulted in targeting of people on both sides. And here's the kicker. People on the other side of an argument from you can generally find your private personal details. 98% of U.S. citizens can have private details uncovered by data brokers. So understand, angry, politically polarized individuals are now able to find private personal details from data brokers on 98% of U.S. citizens. Delete Me research shows the volume of personal data on individuals available online has tripled between 2019 and 2023 to an average of over 525 pieces of personal info per person, available free or for as little as $5 per profile. Do you want that trove of personal data being weaponized and shared? That could take the form not just of harassment, but also of spoofing or reputational attacks, targeting of your family members, targeting of your employer, you name it. Well, Delete Me comes to the rescue. Data that you don't want out there, it'll get removed. The process is super simple. I know because I've done it myself. I submitted my personal information that I wanted removed from search engines and data broker sites. Delete Me's experts find and remove it, and within seven days, I received a detailed report from Delete Me. Simple and effective. Now, because you know all woods here, you can get 20% off all consumer plans by going to joindeleteme.com slash woods and using coupon code woods at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash woods, code woods at checkout. Good, good, good. Now, I'm just curious, when you were with AFP, did you guys have a good working relationship with the Free State Project or not? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The Free State Project, um, you know, we, AFP Foundation, which is the 501c3 arm of, of AFP, uh, sponsors, sponsored uh, Port Fest, you know, the year that we ran into each other. It was actually at the AFP tent that we had set up there. Um, and, and so great partners. I mean, very similar outcome desires, right? I mean, the Free State Project obviously just exists to get freedom-loving people to move to New Hampshire. But then once they move to New Hampshire, AFP... New Hampshire is right there to, to, to give those place an outlet because, it, as you know, the Free State Projects, um, when you sign the pledge, it says once you move to New Hampshire, you'll exert maximum practical effort to achieve liberty in our lifetime. And so the, as a C3, that's all they do. They get people to move here. They've signed the pledge. Great. Um, AFP New Hampshire, we have a lot of Free State friends. Um, I'm not technically a Free Stater. I moved in 2010. But, uh, you know, the definition now has changed. But anyways, what we, we go out, we meet the free staters, we welcome them to the community. Uh, one of the grassroots engagement directors that's with the team now is uh, over at, you know, at, at the new mover parties all the time and, and welcoming those folks to the community and then giving them something that they can do to exert that maximum practical effort to make New Hampshire a freer place. All right. Well, I, I figured, but you, you never know with, with our crazy world, you know, where there's, where there are rivalries or resentments or whatever. So that, that does make me happy. How did you, uh, this is a question I like to ask people I, I'm just meeting. How did you get into all this? Because, you know, the, the, the things we stand for should be more popular than they are. Uh, they shouldn't be some, some weird niche thing. And yet for some reason, you know, we're considered to be out of the mainstream. So given that the ideas that you promote are not the ones that you learned in seventh grade, how did you come to hold them? So well, I grew up um, in, in uh, I grew up in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, the town near, near where you grew up. And my, my grandparents were old school. We didn't talk about politics. We didn't talk about religion, right? Um, in terms of uh, at least federal office. But my grandmother was a select woman. So this never really computed in my mind. And I used to spend, she used to drag us down to, to town hall all the time as a select woman because you know, my mom would be working or whatever. We'd be down at town hall with her while she's doing these select board meetings or finance meetings or, or whatnot. So I, I guess I got a, a preemptory entrance into politics then because you know, you're, you're meeting all these people. You have to be talking to all these people. Um, and I, I enjoyed it. And, and I didn't, but I didn't know why. And, and so 
years later, you know, I, I worked at a grocery market for a grocery store for 10 years. I did, did construction for, for eight after that. And uh, in 2016, I really started paying attention um, when Donald Trump ran because he was saying a lot of things that nobody else would say. And he was promising a lot of things that nobody else would promise. And he was getting vilified for it. And I, I thought it was such a weird phenomenon. Um, and we end, I ended up going to a couple Trump rallies because the, the news was saying, you know, he's racist and he's kicking out Mexicans and he's doing all this and yada, yada. And I was like, I got to go see this for myself. I got to go, go be in it and, and experience this and see if they're telling me the truth. And so we went to um, a Trump rally down in Virginia near where my wife went to, went to college. And it was nothing like the news told me. And I think that's what flipped a switch in my mind that says, this is, this, the, the news, I was at this rally and on that, that, that night I watched CNN and it was completely, it was completely different. And, and I, like my, my brain started like to, to go like, wait a minute, what's happening here? Um, I can't trust the, all right, I can't trust the news. Well, what else can't I trust them on? And that sort of started the journey, right? And then in 2017, um, obviously, Trump is president. We had moved back to New Hampshire um, because we were having our first kid and we wanted to be near family. And so we were back in New Hampshire, <clears throat> back in the New England where I grew up, and I, and I wanted to be more involved in politics. I, wanted, I was like, all right, I'm going to get involved and find out what else I've been lied to about. And maybe I can do something positive um, to, you know, we, we can build on this Trump win. You know, we've got momentum. Maybe we can, you know... Congress can pass this or Congress can pass that. And because that's the way that most people think about it. The federal yeah. government does all this stuff, right? Nobody thinks about their state government. And, and so, and then in 2017, like I said, randomly, I found a, a Facebook ad for this Grassroots Leadership Academy that Americans for Prosperity Foundation hosts. Then I signed us up. Uh, my wife was pregnant when I signed us up. And then, you know, rolls around. Uh, I get home from work that day. I'm tired. I'm sweaty. I've been doing construction. I'm exhausted. I just want to sit on the couch and, and go on Facebook and do my keyboard warrior thing that nobody was listening to. And, and I, I, she goes, oh, we have that thing tonight. And I said, oh, I, don't, I don't really want to go. I'm tired and blah, blah, blah. And she looked at me dead, like square in the eyes. And she says, I haven't been out of this house in six weeks. I haven't spoken to another adult in six weeks. I didn't make dinner and they have food. We're going. Okay, I guess we're going. So I, I got in the shower. We went, right? And, uh, I think that was the start of it. And, and I started meeting you know, all of these people that had, that were on the, on the same side of the aisle in terms of, in terms of their thinking. Certainly not progressive, certainly not um, Democrat. But these people were all, you know, classical, liberal, libertarian, conservative. And it was like, okay. And we're having real deep conversations about things. And... Through, I mean, a year, you know, time and time again, just meeting these people. I ended up working, uh, one, of the, one of the key activists when I started, who was there all the time, was a former Rand Paul staffer. Uh, worked at Rand's office. He had worked on Rand's campaign. He was a Ron Pauler. And I got really close with him. And we would have these, these conversations about policy. And he would just open my eyes to this new way of thinking. Um, and you know the joke, I I'm, sure, I'm sure you know this joke. Do you know the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist? Is it six months? It's six months, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so once you start thinking that way and, and and really thinking about what is the what is the real purpose of government? What is the true meaning and the true purpose of what the government should be doing? And once you drill that down to well, what they should be doing is protecting the rights of the individual. That's it. And when when you start looking at everything that happens after that, it's kind of like, wow, okay, like this is bad, this is good. We can, we, can, we can get government out of the way and just allow people to succeed. Like, why, why do you need a permit to braid hair? Why do you need a permit to cut your children's hair for no money? Like, why, why is that a $1,000 fine and up to a year in jail? And then you start thinking, like, why is it illegal to bring food to homeless people? Like, why are the police departments going out and the health departments and pouring bleach into food that's perfectly good food just because they didn't have a permit to do it. And, you, when, and then, you know, police acting outside of, outside of their lawful, lawful authority and, and government acting outside of their lawful authority. And 
I think the more you see it, the more it reinforces your belief that the, the, there's way too much government and we've got to get rid of as much of it as possible just to allow people to live their lives and be successful. I mean, I, I guess maybe because I've just been around this world for so long, that just sounds so obvious to me that it's just hard for me to believe that I have to argue this with somebody, you know, <laughs> but that's the world we live in. So right now you are on what I still call Twitter as, so Maidment is spelled M-A-I-D-M-E-N-T. So you're on there as Chris Maidment N-H. So people can certainly follow you there. I'll have that link in the description and at tomwoods.com slash 2430. Um, is there anything else you want to, you want to drop here for people to uh, follow you? I mean, obviously, whatever you wind up doing, I'm sure we'll hear about it on Twitter. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be keeping everybody updated. You know, I, like I said at the beginning, I didn't, didn't expect this, this thread on uh, Twitter or X or whatever. I still yeah. call it Twitter, too. Yeah, it's just I just have old habits, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you, I'll be posting updates there. I don't have, I don't have one right now, but... Um, I'm, I'm going to stay, you know, my, my core, my core, uh, passion is for, for doing this kind of work, doing it specifically here in New Hampshire, um, trying to make, you know, this state just better for, for me, my three kids now, uh, to grow up in a better state for them, you know, so that they can go do awesome things. And, and hopefully, hopefully they won't have to get, uh, saddled with, you know, working in politics, hopefully they can go do some, you know, some other cool, cool stuff, like, you know, whatever they want to do. Um, but really just, you know, making sure that they, they have the best path forward, that the government isn't in their way, that the government isn't in the way of, of, you know, my, 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 my friends and my, you know, all these people that are awesome people, free staters, a huge community of Liberty lovers here in New Hampshire. And so, so continuing the work to just get the government out of the way, um, so that, so people can live their lives and be happy and, and pursue their, pursue the American dream or the free state dream or whatever dream they want to pursue. So as long, so long as it isn't hurting other people, right? Well, I'll tell you something, what you did, um, it, as I say, it's so rare to see somebody do it, to just say, I, I mean, we saw it a little bit during COVID of people saying, um, I'm not going to do what you're ordering me to do. And I know that that's coming at an enormous cost. It's coming in some cases at the cost of personal and professional destruction. And yet they did it, but it's very, very rare. So it, it's encouraging to me, not only that you had the stones to do it, but that also other people recognize the value of a person like you and are tripping over themselves to, to get you on board to their next project. So um, I'll be happy to hear about what you wind up doing, but for now, thanks so much for what you did do. I hope you have a great Christmas, uh, despite all this, and thanks so much for talking to us today. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on, Tom, and you know, I hope to see you at Pork Fest or, or Liberty Forum at, at some point in the near future here. Thank you, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.